Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. Look at all of you in your festive Christmas Eve outfits. I'm afraid that I am uh, recording this in Atlanta, but I do have I, I do have a festive Christmas turkey. Look at that. And uh, the Christmas turkey is here, and but that's about. And I have some nice gifts in the background, but that's about all I got. But well, wow. I still believe that yes. Advent is supposed to be purple, so I'm wearing my purple. It's Christmas Eve, and so we shifted. Some of us shifted to red. As but Christmas Eve is still Advent, technically, Matt. Right. But this is the podcast for Christmas Eve 2020. It's also another very important day. Anybody want to point that out? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Caroline. Happy birthday to you. Thank you very much. Yes, it's 39 my again. 39th birthday for the 15th time. That's, uh, yeah. It was a good Do the year. math. Wait, is that right? I don't know. I think so. I'm not yes. sure. <laughs> yes. It is. I've, I've done, I did the math. Look at if right, people Jeff. aren't drawn to the, the video podcast now on YouTube, I don't know who, I don't know what else we can do for them. I know. Uh, this exactly. is a feast for the eyes. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so Joy, a lot what of the text, text for us, Joy. How are we going to, pardon me? What are the texts, Joy? The text for this um, nativity of the Lord is Isaiah chapter nine, verses two through seven. Psalm 96, Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14, and the gospel is Luke, the second chapter, 1 through 14, or you can read all the way through chapter 20. Uh, that's a chapter. That'd be a long reading. Don't do that. Chapter. Let's maybe consider uh, uh, including verses 15 through 20. And a lot of congregations will have their own traditions uh, of perhaps doing carols and lessons, uh, and perhaps um, uh, reading through the whole Christmas story, uh, mix, mashing up uh, Matthew and Luke together. And so uh, obviously uh, respect the tradition of where you are. Um, but for those of you thinking about these texts, um, this year, where, where do these texts uh, take your imagination? This was not a rhetorical question. This was a question. The pause was for us to fill in. <laughs> I'm gonna jump in then and say, um, uh, the line that I highlighted this time was do not be afraid. Uh, it just seems like at the end of this year, uh, hearing those words uh, again as promise and um, not simply as, uh, I've often joked about that. You know, it's like always at the worst time when the appropriate response is to be afraid, there's an angel that says, do not be afraid. And uh, in this particular case, at the end of this year, uh, as we look forward uh, with great expectation and yet in the midst of uh, a, a dysfunctional reality, the promise of the good news uh, that is great joy for all people truly is a message worth hearing. But I think recognizing that this is a moment where fear is also real um, might help us to really experience the incarnation in um, a vital way for our lives this year. For me, the um, the place that uh, I go is the actually, it, especially if you do add the verses uh, and read all the way through twenty. I'm trying to find it here on my um, uh, computer again. Uh, the last verse: the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God. Um, that they they worship they uh, they come to worship pay homage to or whatever, it doesn't use that word, but uh, the, the newborn king, but they return 
glorifying and praising God. It's, it just strikes me that in this particular year, when uh, we're probably not gathering uh, uh, at the church building, uh, that what the church does is uh, glorifies and praises God in daily life. And so that that might have a particular, we can't be there to sing all the familiar songs uh, and glorify and praise God in the sanctuary, but we do it where we, uh, where we live out our vocations. For the shepherds, that's in the fields uh, uh, where their charges uh, are kept. And so that's what they do. So that's what hit, struck me today. I was uh, struck. I, I always like it when we when we do uh, this question, particularly for a day like this, and I think, uh, and particularly for a time like this. Of and and again, it's you know, it's an invitation to the preacher too to do the same thing. Uh, that they you know that they don't have to they don't have to say oh I'm going to pick what Rolf picked or I'm going to pick what Joy picked or Caroline picked or Matt picked like what would you pick what is striking you uh, this year uh, with uh, with where we are in our world and I went with verse 19 if you add those verses which I totally would uh, Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. Uh, the verb ponder is such an interesting word uh, in Greek because uh, it's, it's a compound word of, of balo and then soon, so throw with. It can be translated meet or consider or compare. And then in the case of, you know, of, of the NRSV ponder. And I just think that's a really powerful verb right now. Of, of, of how, of, of considering, or how, how are all these words meeting? <laughs> how are all these events um, being thrown together? Uh, and, and this convergence of realities and, and just sitting with that, pondering that, that throwing togetherness of everything that has, that, that how we're experiencing Christmas and uh, the coming up to the end of 2020 and uh, and at, at Sumbalo and, and that word is not just, it, it takes away a little bit, I think for me, importantly, it takes a bit away a little bit of that sentimentality of it. Uh, that she's not just pondering like, oh, that's nice. <laughs> but it's, it's pondering is, is throwing things together and, and, and of this mishmash of, of, of things. And so uh, that's where I sit this year um, is a, a kind of pondering that is, uh, is, it takes some effort. <laughs> uh, and uh, that is, that is not just, uh, not just thinking um, or reflection, reflect, reflecting, but this really sort of experience of how things have converged, how things have met and what might this mean. Not so much curiosity, but more scratching of the head. I've got two sermons brewing this year, one on Luke 2 and one on Isaiah 9. But since all of you did Luke, I'll, I'll stay there. But for Luke 2, I'm just going to settle into verses uh, 13 and 14 when the, when the heavenly host uh, praises God and says, glory to God in the highest heaven and honor of peace among those whom God favors. And I would probably say something like, everything's different this year, uh, but the message is the same and the story is the same. And so here's the part of the story we're, we hear all the time. I'm not gonna even try to adorn it in any particular way. I'm gonna acknowledge the difference and the struggle and the disappointment uh, and the fear that's in the air, but I'm going to say in moments like that, sometimes what the church does is it leans back on its old stories and its old practices and says, nevertheless, uh, we're going to choose to praise God right now in the midst of mystery. We're proclaiming a mystery. We're proclaiming it into a difficult, mysterious time. We don't know what the other side is going to look like, um, but we don't have anything we don't have anything new to say <laughs> that we haven't already said before. And I would just kind of, I would kind of frame it that way of we're gonna rely on what's gotten us here so far. And just kind of plain, you know, of course you're doing new things, but I would kind of plainly to say, 
we were made for moments like this. The church was, you know, we've got everything we need to survive moments like this. Doesn't mean it's not going to hurt, but we're ready for this. And we have been ready for this. And this is the message uh, that sustains us. I got one more shtick on Luke too, that I am borrowing from a friend. I don't, I don't claim that this is my shtick. And that is the census, uh, especially for people living in the United States. Uh, and of course, we know that not all of our listeners are, but uh, that we've had uh, a census this year. And a census is about counting people, um, obviously for the purposes of the empire. But there's also something then that, that you could flip it and talk about the incarnation is about who counts. Um, and so that this message about uh, the son of God taking on human flesh is about all of humanity counting to God and about that you as an individual count to God enough uh, for God to take on flesh and die for you. So that's another, if you're looking for a homiletical hook, like I said, borrowed from a friend. So Matt, you also have an Isaiah one? I, I do, yeah, and, you know, this is, I, I think a lot of, a lot of people are going to be pre-recording their their Christmas Eve sermons. No shame in that uh, at all. And this is the you know the visuals and the imagery of this text allow you to do some things. So instead of sitting in front of your computer and reading the text or having a lay reader do that, uh, play around with light and darkness. You know, go read it outside at night or something like that, or with a spotlight. Um, if you've got some old combat boots and clothes you don't know what to get rid of and they're too beat up to give away, then Go burn them in the church parking lot and and read by that and or find images and again not every congregation is as comfortable with this but find images uh, of like a neonatal unit or something like that and talk about the hope that comes this is a, a passage that, it's one of my favorite things to hear on christmas eve is isaiah 9 and it's the idea of hope being in the birth of a child, which on the one hand is utterly ordinary, stuff happens all the time, we're used to it. People who um, are in obstetrics <laughs> are nonplussed by it for the most part, because it's work. But for the people, you know, for the, for the mother, for the father, for the parents, for the wider family, time stops, right? And this is the most important thing. And here's this amazing thing. So I would just try to capture some of that, that in the midst of suffering, we've got promise and this notion of life goes on, you know, life continues, death continues, war start, war cease, but there's a sense of divine faithfulness in that. And we derive hope from the places where we're paying attention, you know, where, what our eyes are directed toward. And so that's the preacher's power is, what are you gonna put in front of people? What imagery? Uh, that the people will carry with them as an as a literal image of hope to sustain them. So I'd do something with that. I, this is where I'd get creative, even though I don't really have a message. I have more of a medium for thinking about this, and that's to uh, get, get out of your office or get out of your your living room and and um, remind people where there are signs of grace breaking in in the ordinary. If I have, oh, go ahead, Joy. Go ahead, because I'm going to make a shift. So go ahead, Carol. Oh, I, I, uh, I also have an Isaiah sermon, <laughs> and uh, and it's uh, related to uh, related in part to what you were just talking about, uh, Matt. But for a child has been born for us, a son given to us, authority rests upon his shoulders, and the naming part of this child uh, is wonderful counsel mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. And I would, uh, that I think that could be another sermon direction that when, when this child gets named, uh, it's, it's named by particular kinds of, of, of descriptors, adjectives uh, that point to, of course, how this child, what this child will embody in the world. Uh, and so I would, uh, I would, you know, in that act of naming, um, in that act of naming how uh, the future 
of God's revelation and the future of, of what God, uh, God hopes for and intends in Jesus, uh, we're getting a glimpse of that and maybe doing a little bit of unpacking of each of those four names and what they might mean for us now and what they might mean, uh, as you said, uh, Matt, of, of uh, intimations of grace, uh, but then also what we might look forward to. Ralph might want to go back to Isaiah, and that's fine, but I'm, I'm grateful that I let you go first, Caroline, because um, the shift I was going to make was to the psalm, um, and it, it, it was lifted up with uh, Matt talking about this is, uh, this is what we were made for. This is, this is the old story that's the same story that it, it is right for now as it was then. And the psalm begins, oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Um, but uh, then it says, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. And so I'm really glad that uh, you went first, Caroline, to lift up that what is that name? Um, and so the new song is not something that we're looking for, but it is what we know about who God is. It's it's that we were made for this, Matt. I'm gonna I'm gonna be quoting that a few times around. Well if people want to preach on uh on Titus, you're welcome to do that. <laughs> There's a great commentary on online by our, our colleague at Luther Seminary, Jenny Peets, which can help with that. I want to, if I can be bold enough to start to move us toward the end, I just want to um, offer a, a thank you to our listeners and our and those preachers at, at Christmas, which is always a busy and sometimes anxious time of the year for folks in ministry, doubly, triply so this year. And you've you're tapped out creatively. Uh, a lot of you, you're you've got rituals and memorials stacked up for when you can open up again. Uh, I hope you're able to get some time to um, take in some of these promises you proclaim. And happy birthday, Caroline. 